Kim, what's on your radar? Well, many of us did not believe Russia was going to invade Ukraine. Obviously, we got this one wrong. But for many years, people from policy experts to world leaders have been warning that the West NATO expansion towards Ukraine would result in exactly what's happening now, Russia resorting to force to keep Ukraine out of NATO. Here's Mikhail Gorbachev in April of 1997 speaking to members of Congress, warning them about the planned expansion of NATO. And I'm not persuaded by the assurances that we hear that Russia has nothing to worry about. You cannot, you may not humiliate a nation, a people, and think that uh, it'll have no consequences. So my question is, is this a new strategy? It was Gorbachev who Bush Sr. made the assurances to that NATO wouldn't expand. So when he talks about being humiliated, it's likely also personal. But just stop for a moment and think. This was 1997, 25 years ago. We've been aggressively expanding NATO for over two decades before Russia ultimately snapped. Another warning came in 2010. Here's Russian historian and NYU professor Stephen F. Cohen speaking at Carnegie Mellon. NATO expansion is not over for the Russians. It's a reality. NATO's sitting on its borders. It's not about future NATO expansion, it's about current. Uh, NATO expansion represents the following to Russia. And on the, near this I will end. It represents a profoundly broken promise to Russia made by the first Bush that in return for united Germany and NATO, NATO would not expand eastward. This is, this is beyond any dispute. People say, well, they never signed a treaty. But a deal is a deal. The United States gives its word, unless we're shysters, and if you don't get it in writing, we'll cheat you. We broke our word. And when both Putin and Medvedev say publicly to Madeleine Albright and others, we, Russia, feel deceived and betrayed, that's what they're talking about. So NATO represents, on the part of Russia, a lack of trust. You break your words to us. What can, to what extent can we trust you? Secondly, it represents military encirclement. If you, look, if you sit in the Kremlin and you look out at where NATO is and where they want to go, it's everywhere. It's everywhere on Russia's borders. So he makes a great point about honoring our word, even if it isn't in writing, unless we're a bunch of shysters, he says. And maybe we are. In 2015, international relations expert John Mersheimer talked about how we're purposefully baiting Ukraine to take a hard line with Russia under false promises of inviting them into the West. But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And I believe that the policy that I'm advocating, which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side, is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We're in encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this. And the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. Ultimately, Ukraine gets wrecked, he says. And that was in 2015, and we're watching this now in real time. The Ukrainians and Russians sat down at peace talks, and rather than agree to become neutral, which is Russia's demand, 
Ukraine is taking a hard line and we're witnessing their country get destroyed as a result. And now it's likely the country will be split in two or possibly three the further Ukraine goes into the conflict unwilling to negotiate. Yesterday in Biden's State of the Union address, he said, quote, the NATO alliance was created to secure peace and stability in Europe after World War II. But I got to admit, it's not feeling like it. Biden also said Putin had rejected repeated efforts at diplomacy, but many of us are wondering what those diplomacy attempts were. Russia has been clear for nearly three decades now, no NATO on their borders. They've said it over and over and over again, and yet we've continued to expand. We've expanded NATO and invaded and occupied various areas of the Middle East. Europe has created a union of member nations, and yet all the while we've been accusing Russia of wanting to reestablish the USSR. We've even put missiles up to their border in our NATO member states as a response. And now we're all in danger, not just Ukrainians, of an all-out nuclear war because our leaders continue to refuse to back down. The irony is when Russia annexed Crimea and when Assad was accused of gassing his own people, American neocons were upset Obama had set a red line but refused to actually do anything about it when it was crossed. Those same neocons are shocked Putin actually said arming Ukraine is a red line and meant it. He wasn't bluffing and he's not going to back down. The Russians have told us this would happen for decades now. I see many people saying it shouldn't be up to us or Russia if Ukraine joins NATO, that each country should be allowed to decide for themselves. But it doesn't work like that. NATO isn't a right. It's a club. It's an agreement that if one nation is invaded, the others will come to their collective defense. We should be allowed to choose who we want to rush to the defense of and who we think will be, in, in, will be valuable in our defense when needed. The point of NATO is safety in numbers. But if adding a member makes the entire group unsafe, it defeats the point. But honestly, this entire situation with Ukraine and the U.S.'s unwillingness to militarily defend Ukraine because we don't want a nuclear war with Russia, which I agree with, calls into question the entire point to NATO. NATO was formed specifically to go to war with the Soviets. But if we're unwilling to go to war with them because it's a complete danger, then what is the actual purpose of NATO? But ultimately, my point is, the dog barked and barked and growled and growled. People even pointed year after year that the dog is growling and dangerous, yet we kept taunting the dog, and now the dog is attacking. And we're sitting here acting shocked, claiming that there was no provocation on our end. So, you know, uh, look, uh, it's terrible what is happening in Ukraine. Absolutely atrocious. John Mersheimer was right, though. That was seven years ago when he said, we're telling him to go do this. We're, we're giving them this emboldening, you know, we're emboldening Ukraine to make them feel like they can go in and and confront Russia. And now you've got Zelensky begging, right, just begging to be in the to be admitted into the EU, asking, you know, let, let's, you know, we need a no fly zone. So basically, help us go to war with Russia on our behalf, begging for this, let us into the West, let us into your world, you know, and then you've got Biden almost insultingly yesterday at the State of the Union address saying, uh, we're not going to go into Ukraine. We're not going to battle Russia. But NATO, you know, we're going to protect our NATO nations. And if there's any sort of provocation on our NATO nations, then we're going to use the full force of NATO to counter it, which we don't even know. You know, like I said, we've never actually gone to war with the Soviets head on or with Russia head on. Right now, we don't want to. We're looking at it like, oh, my, that would be nuclear annihilate, you know, for everybody, the world. So would we really, if push came to shove, you know, would we actually go to the defense? To what level would we actually do? You know, it's a game of chicken right now. So, um, you know, this is a disaster. But the biggest issue is our unwillingness as a nation to put aside our exceptionalism and to sit here and think, we do no wrong. We are America, we do no wrong. And the Australian former prime, prime minister actually uh, said the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, he was saying, America, you know, she wants to rule the world and she thinks that she can do no wrong. And in the end, it's going to cause us problems. He was talking about Australia. And so we need to maybe kind of uh, distance ourselves from this. And you've got Putin in a, he was at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in 2016, you know, looking very, very frustrated, speaking and saying, I don't know how to get through to you people anymore. We've said this over and over and over again. You guys are lying to us when you say that you're putting missiles right up to our border and you're telling us we have nothing to worry about, that it's all about Iran you know, that you're just trying to defend against Iran. And it's, he's like, you're lying to us and we know it. So what do we do now? You know, this is the big question. What do we do now and why our government works for us? We have to remember they're our government. They're doing this on our behalf. They're putting us in danger. We have to speak out and say, 
no, we're fed up. We're not going to let you do this. We get it. Putin's a bad dog, right? He's the bad guy. Yes, he's, a, he's attacking. He's bad. You don't like that dog. That dog's always been a problem. Fine. But you provoked it. And you've got to take responsibility for that. And we, the American people, need to tuck our tail between our legs just for once in order to prevent nuclear annihilation. I would like to see that happen, but it's not. Well, but there, but there comes a point where where you have to fight that dog, right? Okay, yeah, it it bites Ukraine. We're not going to rush in there to kill. I mean, I, I hate this metaphor because it involves dogs being hurt. But we, like, if they attack a NATO member, then yes, we have to defend them because, like, we can't just let Russia overrun the entire country unless that's what you're saying. It's fine if all of Europe, if Russia conquers all of Europe. Which I don't there, think. Well, there, for one, I don't think that's that. an actual reality. I don't. I think that that is warmongering language that they have brainwashed us into believing that Russia wants to expand and recreate the USSR. And even if Putin thought the USSR was great, I don't think they have actual uh, an inclination to take that on financially. But I, you know, but they have made very clear the Baltic nations was very aggressive against them. Poland was aggressive. You know, adding these nations right on their border is aggressive against them. So they're, they, yeah, they could they could feel at some point very emboldened and feel like, that's it, we're gonna go denuclearize. I mean, every every you know, empire, every areas. large country, every, every superpower in Europe, right, through, through all of modern history has felt the pull from, you know, from Napoleon to, to the, the previous monarchs of France, Germany, et cetera, like, have all felt the pull of seizing territory on their borders. So it would be, it is not an aberration or weird for for Putin to feel that same pull, I think. I so mean, well, we're I, talking about a different era. You know, the United States used to go around conquering and invade. You know, I mean, we still can. But, you know, we <laughs> imperialism, that that form of imperialism but why do you, is Why over. do you pivot to you what know, we're not talking school. about? What, yes, what we're doing is bad. There's no disagreement there. But also right. what Russia is doing is bad and well, concerning I, if it's going yeah. to go beyond taking over Ukraine. I think that I think our quote unquote, the discourse like has a problem with this situation in particular because it's a both things are true case and we don't do both things are true at all in the United States. In, in, in our in our just in our converse, in our political conversations, only one thing can be true. But in this case, both things are true. You know, Putin's ag aggressive overreaction is is unforgivable. It is it, it's it's well, he had a red brutal. line. And blah, I blah, mean, blah. All again, of these you know, people... yes, but, let, but here's the thing. Right. You don't let me get to the other thing. It is also <laughs> it is also true that the United States pressure to continue to push NATO into Georgia, into Latvia, into into Poland uh, just, and to continue to pull Ukraine you know, toward the West, to continue to arm Ukraine, uh, that all of those actions also were provocations and were said by Russia repeatedly to be provocations. It is also true that just because you provoke somebody, it doesn't justify them murdering you. Right. But it, it, do, but it is worth talking about. If in the Mersheiner uh, lecture that, that you mentioned there, I think is persuasive and is, is well worth watching. A week ago or so, I saw it had more than like six million views on it, it you know, because it, it, yeah. it's really resonating with people and it's, and it's, and it's making the rounds again, and, and deservedly so. And his, and his point is that if you make Ukraine a neutral buffer country, as is appropriate to do between you know, two empires, two great powers, Europe and, and Russia, then it's better for Europe, it's better for right. Ukraine, it's better for Russia. I think that's a persuasive case. You have a lot, like you said, you have a lot of people who say, well, it's up to Ukraine. Well, yes and no. Right. You know, it's not necessarily up to Ukraine whether or not whether and and in fact, the NATO has not allowed Ukraine in. So it's not just right. up to Ukraine; it's up to NATO as well. NATO has agency in this, and they did the the worst of both worlds by teasing that they're constantly constantly teasing that they're going to allow NATO in, uh, allow Ukraine into NATO, but then not actually doing it uh, because they recognize that it's not something that they want to create a nuclear war over. And right. so, as Robbie and I were talking about earlier. The, the end result here is is a tragedy and a failure. Yeah, and so it's worth looking at I think, everything and, that led up. We're to not it. the three of us aren't disagreeing at all. Like right. the, what the practical implications of all this. Right. Is. Right. Just means we, we can't let Putin off the hook. Right. Just, yeah. Right. The, the situation is 
bad. I, but, and we, we agree that we could have averted it if, if we had not been uh, offering or dangling or gaslighting Ukraine about potential right. NATO membership. I, I think we all agree on like the situation we're in. I just, we, can all, we can have that you know, be the reality, and all, but also I think we should be very, you know, have moral clarity about how evil this is without going, oh, right. but the U.S. is also bad sometimes. Yes, the U.S. is also bad sometimes, no, but, but I, we're just but talking I, about I, Russia I, right now being again, bad. But again, you know, 20, 25 years since that Gorbachev speech, so at what point would, you know, we never backed down. We never were willing to compromise on this. We have continued yeah. on and on and on and on. So the big question then is, what would have been the response from Russia that you would have accepted? Continue to lay down and take it? Because that's what they're, that's what they're saying. Is don't they're saying, invade saying the countries that neighbor you. I would say the same thing to any nation on earth. <laughs> like, do not invade your, do not grab territory, do not invade that. It is wrong to do that, whether you're the US or Russia or China or Venezuela, or Italy, or Montenegro, right. and also, or South Africa, like, just don't attack your neighbors. The, and the argument that it's just completely up to Ukraine is undermined by the fact that the U.S. very actively supported the sure. coup in 2014. Right. But we, we don't, right. it, it is bad to start wars regardless of you, and gen, a lot of anti-war people on the left will say that in general, but in, in this case, or other cases, they'll go, oh, they'll, they're making excuses for it because they can't say anything nice about the U.S. or something, I guess. Right. No, it's not that. It's just that at some point you have to realize that, you know, we poked the we poked the bear a lot. But, you know, I guess I, I agree that the alternative could have been a regime change, a coup. That's what we do. That's how we handle it. We don't invade anymore. We just go in and uh, overturn the governments in a variety of different color revolutions or uh, taking them out one way or the other. Yeah, but th th that's that a bad happen. policy because it usually has worse right. consequences, right? Than of what it, it's not it's because these countries have some right to be ruled by murderous dictators. I mean, we need to denuclearize the world. That's the solution. We need to. Everybody goes great. We need to de yeah. de government the world. All right, we'll have more rising <laughs> after this. Borders cause wars.